Hello, I'm Annalisa McDaniel. I'm a drainage and wastewater planner with Seattle Public Utilities. And I'd like to welcome you all to our last Shape Our Water Speaker Series event. And if this is the first uh, speaker series event that you've attended, welcome. And um, if you've been with us through the summer, welcome back. We've sponsored this series to feature ideas and real world examples from experts in urban water management and community resilience. So I hope that you've learned something from this series or that presentations have sparked some curiosity for you. Um, if you've missed a presentation and you'd like to go back and watch it, all of our events were recorded and they're on the SPU YouTube channel, and we have a Shaper Water playlist that contains all of the speaker series videos. If you're an SPU staff person, you can go to the Shape Our Water News SharePoint page, and the videos are linked there as well. And as a reminder, this event is being recorded. Um, we'll have a presentation from our guests and followed by a question and answer period moderated by Rosie Fink from Brown and Caldwell. And we just decided that we'll Turn the, we'll turn the camera off or the recording off for the um, question and answer in case that uh, makes people feel a little bit more comfortable to ask questions and have a discussion. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, and we are fortunate to be joined by Mark Camarada, who is the Deputy Water Commissioner for Planning and Environmental Services for the Philadelphia Water Department. His responsibilities include the integration, direction, and management of the department's planning initiatives and environmental programs focused on wet weather compliance, source water protection, green infrastructure implementation, facility and linear asset renewal and replacement, ecological restoration, laboratory services, energy, and climate mitigation and adaptation. He has over 23 years of experience in water resource engineering and environmental planning. So thanks so much for joining us today, Mark. I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank All right. you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to share a bit of the story, especially with our friends out on the West Coast. Um, really grateful to be able to represent the department um, and uh, what has probably been about 20 years of thinking about sustainable infrastructure uh, and about 10 years of, of implementation uh, of, of that infrastructure. Um, so those that know me know I speak quickly. Uh, I like to take three times as much information and cram it into you know uh, one time slot. Um, apparently, I didn't get a chance to speak as a kid, so I try to make up for it as an adult. So um, hold on to your seats, and we'll we'll get going here. But uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Um, so uh, just providing the presentation description for the record here. I think you you had that circulated before. Um, but let me jump right in and kind of talk about, uh, you know, a lot of folks show the, the, you know, the statistics about their utility or their city when they give a presentation. And I like to kind of give a little glimpse into who we are. Um, you know, most folks have in their, in their mission, uh, you know, their, their utility or service providers, right? Water, waste, water, stormwater. In our case, we are a, 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 a three, uh, three utility, uh, kind of group here. Um, but really it's the, it's the second phase of our mission statement. Um, that really adds kind of the soul of who we are and how we want to kind of fulfill our mission. And that's really some of these bolded words here, customer focused, equitable, cost effective, uh, involving the public, knowing that we're a part of an economic you know, engine for, the, for Philadelphia. And really my, my favorite one is that bottom uh, is environmental stewardship, which is really trying to bring a, a you know, obviously a different, different lens than, than maybe some other utility providers. Um, so that's kind of the, the who we are. And I really think it sets the tone for what you're going to see in this presentation. Um, as a one water utility, uh, we have lots of responsibilities, combined sewer overflow, you know, concerns, uh, permits with our municipal separate storm system, uh, you know, involved in stream and habitat restoration, uh, TMDLs for uh, PCBs and nutrients in some of our water bodies, uh, source water protection for, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks of about 2 million people and who we serve, yet we control about, you know, 2% of the, of the watershed uh, in which, uh, you know, which provides our source water. Um, you know, thinking of always about stakeholder goals uh, and, and what it is we need to do for future regulations, whether that's ammonia, emerging contaminants, uh, you know, thinking about climate adaptation and, and, and flood mitigation. So we've always had these responsibilities. Um, how did we try to think about it a little more holistically, uh, you know, long term watershed wide? Um, when we embarked on our CSO plan uh, in the, the late 1990s, um, you know, like most urban corridors, when you look at the receiving waters you're, you're here to protect, you notice a lot of things. The obvious of the water quality, uh, you know, due to combined sewer overflows and, and separate storm sewers, 
but you have water quality issues and low dissolved oxygen. You don't have habitat, uh, poor biological diversity. These things are kind of very, very common in, in highly degraded or highly urbanized, uh, you know, old, old environments. So when we look at the challenges we have in our in our receiving waters um, and we think about what it is we're trying to do to cast a, a program to kind of uh, ameliorate the effects of of wet weather on these, the, you know, the, the ecology, the streams, improve water quality. Um, we were trying to look around the city and saying, well, what, what's happening around the city at this point? Um, you know, there was a citywide sustainability movement uh, really trying to increase livability and public health, uh, you know, really trying to, to to figure out ways to to stimulate a local and green economy. So it really was a nice time for us to cast a combined sewer overflow program uh, that really incorporated a lot of non-traditional infrastructure. Um, when you think about what we need to do as, as again, the water utility providers, Clean Water Act goals of fishable, you know, swimmable, safe drinking water act goals of, 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 of drinkable. Uh, and then you add the second element of our mission statement about, you know, customer equity, environmental stewardship. We really started to build a program that thought about these other elements, the safe, attractive, accessible, just, uh, you know, affordable uh, elements. And I really think that's the, the foundation of Green City Clean Waters. Um, for those that are into kind of combined sewer overflow permit, you know, order negotiations, here's a little timeline. The point I bring this up is that it was a long time in the making. It took some time to negotiate. We've been implementing for 10 years, but uh, what we are delivering is part of a long term uh, control plan uh, based on a consent order with the state and administrative order with our regulatory agencies. Um, so a little glimpse into the components. Uh, you know, a lot of folks talk about single digit overflows, uh, 90 something percent capture. Our program is really about 85 percent. Uh, it's the presumptive approach for the CSO nerds out there. 85% um, equivalent mass uh, removal. Um, it involves heavy amounts of green infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, enhancements to our collection system and treatment plants, and some, uh, you know, asset uh, uh, rehabilitation through interceptor lining. But the bulk of the program is really green infrastructure. Um, just another way to look at it, we're required to, to mitigate uh, or reduce our combined sewer overflow contribution to four receiving bodies by about 8 billion gallons. Um, at the end of our 25 year plan, we're going to be left with still around six and a half billion gallons of overflow. So this program is the start of what should be something much bigger uh, and will take decades in, in the works. Um, today, I'm really going to focus on the Green Acre side of it. Uh, the focus of this presentation is about lessons learned uh, and the importance of partnerships. So I just want to launch right into it there. Um, I know this crowd is probably very familiar with sustainable infrastructure. I highlighted a lot of the keywords here, intercept, infiltrate, evaporate, transpire, harvest and reuse, uh, in some case, store and slow release uh, back into the system. Um, we have to deliver 10,000 green acres, which is really just a measure of volume. I know it's green acre makes you think it's more of a, uh, an area calculation, uh, but it's really about managing the first inch and a half of runoff from every directly connected acre of impervious to our combined sewer system. Um, they actually are not physical green acres. Um, we actually could have uh, a, a porous pavement, which has no green representation whatsoever. Um, but if it's managing an inch and a half from uh, a, a directly connected impervious acre, uh, we actually call it a, a, a green acre. So little funky. I blame uh, some of the folks I worked with, uh, you know, a decade plus ago for the term, uh, but we're living with it. Um, how do we deliver 10,000 green acres in a highly urbanized old uh, environment? Um, I call this kind of our implementation philosophy. Um, stormwater regulations, if you think about it, how do we prevent our water quality issues from getting any worse as we modify property and land uh, in, in public and private spaces? How do we make sure that we're regulating stormwater to make sure it's not exacerbating the issues we have in, in the urbanized environment? Um, the incentivized retrofits, how do we take parcels and land use um, uh, you know, characteristics that are already there? And how do we kind of incentivize folks to to, to redesign and, and, and rehab their facilities uh, to actually contribute less stormwater to our system. And then how do we take the limited public dollars we have and directly invest them in key, uh, hopefully appealing uh, uh, projects where we can actually make uh, investments in, in what we own as, as a water department or what we have access to in the water department as public right away, being streets, parks, facilities. Um, I'm gonna jump into regulations. I always start these presentations by saying, um, we could not deliver long-term compliance without the help and support of our private development community um, and without the regulations that we put in place in around 2006. Um, if you're not familiar, we actually regulate water quality, flood protection, and channel protection. Basically, we require anyone that disturbs area of 15,000 square feet or more 
is required to meet some technical requirements for ENS, public health and safety, and then kind of pre and post condition stormwater management. Um, it's not just about build it and forget it. Um, we here just gratuitous glam photos of, of how the development community really integrates it into residential property, uh, into um, uh, housing, uh, green roof surface practices. Uh, the photo in the upper left, I believe, is a uh, um, uh, university kind of installation. Um, but it's not just about building it and forgetting about it. When you actually use private delivery for long term compliance, we have to make sure that it's owned, operated and maintained uh, into the future. Um, so we require that that there's deed restrictions and, and that the owner knows what their 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 responsibilities are. Um, but we also really take part in making sure that that what is being constructed is the absolute best. So uh, really just kind of dedicating the workforce uh, to do inspections, close out and actually do maintenance uh, uh, inspections as well and enforcement. So thinking about this as long term assets in which we need uh, for long term compliance and, and to get the stormwater management that we need. Um, we would never have been able to inject ourselves into a development process without a very healthy and strong relationship with the development community. Um, in 2012, we created what was known as a development services committee, which were some really big real estate developers in the city of Philadelphia. And a lot of the engineering firms uh, and planning and design firms uh, that would do a lot of work for those large real estate developers. Um, what it did is it really gave us a forum to work with uh, uh, the development community to talk about what it is we need to do, what their role is in sustainable uh, infrastructure, um, you know, moving forward for, for the next couple decades. Um, related to that uh, are many other uh, um, uh, associations that we connect with from the private development world, whether it's Building Industry Association, uh, Sustainable Business Network, um, other city departments. And you can see the role um, a lot of these agencies play in, uh, you know, permitting and inspection and enforcement and even just you know dealing with tax abatements and and, and meeting certain deadlines as developers um, and and really you know enforcement elements as well. So um, I wanted to throw these out there. I know partnerships is the key here. And again, there's so many people involved in making sure our regulations are, are delivering at scale. Um, what do those relationships do for you? Well, they allow you to get a little more creative with how you want to regulate development, particularly how you want to enforce stormwater regulations. Um, so we offer some carrots like expedited reviews when there's a high presence of sustainable infrastructure. Um, we also worked uh, with the community to, to, to work on density bonuses, uh, worked with city council and some, uh, some politicians to uh, figure out a way to increase density uh, um, if applications, uh, uh, I mean, if developers were using green roofs. So that kind of symbiotic relationship uh, really led to, to some kind of creative ideas to get green out there quickly um, again, building out there quickly, uh, so we all kind of gain, um, you know, from development. The second phase of of our delivery uh, is what we know as our incentivized retrofits, um, which was all predicated on a parcel charge that was uh, created and added around 2014. Um, we used to bill for uh, stormwater based on the size of your water meter. Um, so if you were a high rise apartment in the city of Philadelphia, you had a massive water meter, um, but you actually had a small uh, footprint, a small gross area. Even though it was highly impervious, it was still small. Um, but a, a, an entity like a big box store, I'll leave names out, um, with a very small water meter, maybe for a garden center and, and uh, um, uh, uh, restroom facilities, um, with a huge parking lot in large impervious and large gross area, was actually paying very small. So what we did is we reallocated the way we build. Um, those that, that contribute more to the system pay more. Uh, those that contribute less had their, their bill readjusted. It affected large uh, industrial, commercial, large residential property. Um, residential folks uh, didn't see a reallocation of the bill because they were actually paying uh, an appropriate share when we looked at um, cost of service and how we wanted to allocate charges. Um, what that did is it really shed light on the fact that if you have impervious cover in large area, um, you really will see it in your bill and we will hopefully give you the incentive to do something. Well, it actually wasn't enough until we actually started throwing some grant money um, at these facilities. So um, not only do we give money to retrofit parcels, but when you do that retrofit, you actually get the fee reduction on your bill uh, based on your new areas. So just an example um, of, of, of a school, a uh, large impervious area. Um, you can see a small grant award uh, gave a billing credit um, and they see again a reduction in their stormwater charge. We get Green Acre credits uh, and there's O&M agreements. Um, the site gets maintained. 
uh, and we we uh, we get what we need, which is stormwater management and one step closer to long term compliance and uh, improving the water quality in our streams. Um, like everything else uh, or like the development uh, regs I said before, it's not just about building it and, and making a requirement that it be maintained. It's really working with property owners and trying to see how we can keep the program moving. So not only we think about O and M agreements and linking it to credit renewal, renewal to make sure it's an asset uh, in the future, um, we encourage more. Um, so we now have created credits explorers uh, and parcel viewers, which give customers or give uh, property owners the ability to go and look at their parcels and see how they could make changes and see what the benefits would be to their bill um, and and you know just some other some other information as well. Um, we also just constantly uh, you know try to get the best and latest and greatest information out. Uh, education information on our website, allow people to do online submissions, um, uh, a little more clarity on how we uh, grade uh, competitive grant applications through explanations of our rubric, uh, and always just trying to offer guidance, knowing how important uh, the private delivery uh, of, of uh, Green Acres are for our compliance objectives. Um, again, how does that healthy relationship, you know, what does that lead to? Um, it leads to other ideas like banking and trading and fee and lieu, uh, and, and some other creative uh, uh, arrangements that we're cooking up with purchase of assets, uh, oversizing public and allowing private to connect, uh, convincing private to upsize and allowing us to connect public runoff with some incentives. So lots of interesting things out there. So it's not really just about regulate and, and incentivize through a grant program. We really are thinking about these other project delivery methods. Um, we've yet to crack the true pay for performance and, and P3 model uh, due to some enabling legislation issues in, in uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, but we're getting close and we have uh, not a workaround, but we have some creative ways to still get uh, performance contracting and 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 partnerships uh, through some of these methods. Um, we'll go to that third delivery arm, which I'm going to spend the majority of time on because I actually think it's really one of the most special uh, you know ways of how cities align, how we align with residents, um, and how we're really delivering. I think what have been some showpiece uh, green infrastructure practices throughout the city. Um, so just again, some some glam shots of what we're talking about on public lands and then just kind of what we've learned throughout the process. So I'm going to carve through some of these going to go rather quickly. A lot of information on slides, but really for you to peruse uh, later on when I share the slide deck. Um, it all starts with our our, our neighbors, right? Um, we live in these cities that we're trying to modify. Uh, you know, we really encourage every ability we have to communicate with our residents, whether it's social media, uh, signage, um, art installations, uh, uh, interpretive centers, web presence, uh, design competitions, stormwater stenciling, you name it. Um, we can't invest in in the neighborhood to protect you know, our water resources if we're not connecting with our neighbors. So our, it all starts with education and outreach and a very comprehensive program. Um, this is really just another graphic like the one before, um, kind of showing the spectrum here of, of you know, meeting flyers, right? Your paper kind of distribution or social media all the way to the right, which is actually community events and, and watershed stewards. So you can see all the tools that are out there to really think about connecting with, you know, with with our neighbors, um, you know, with our residents, with our ratepayers uh, to really start to spread the word of what it is we're trying to accomplish uh, with uh, distributed nature based infrastructure um, that feeds obviously into our planning approach. Um, when you look at a, an urban you know, environment, uh, you know, uh, uh, like Philadelphia, um, you're seeing the outline here of our street grid in our combined sewer section of the city. The other periphery areas are our separate stormwater areas. Um, our program is really predicated on implementing in the combined sewer section, although I'll show you a slide later on of what's happening, uh, you know, how green infrastructure is being delivered in, in those outside areas. Um, but our planning approach is really focused on the street grid, uh, really understanding the parcel uses that are out there, um, understanding ownership, and you can see from this graphic, majority of the land is privately owned. So you would say, how in heck could you deliver a lot of public infrastructure if you don't own the land? Um, the idea is to kind of take that private runoff and figure out how to manage it in our public spaces. Um, and the way to do that is actually forging partnerships, which again is one of the foundation concepts throughout this entire presentation. Um, I mentioned this, uh, and if mommy is still here and listening to this, she was instrumental in actually helping us create when she was at Philly Water. Um, this district based planning approach, which really started to, uh, you know, identify our planners and our outreach specialists, our designers, our engineers and those that serve in the professional design community really started to understand the, the, the neighborhoods and the, the geography in which they were trying to to retrofit. Um, what it allowed us to do is really understand the site context, 
and work with very specific partners that lived within those areas and understand how PWD's objectives really can meet the needs of those community members. Um, our strategic planning approach, a shout out to our planning team. Um, they've updated this graphic. I just did not change the date on that uh, on that document, but um, we do have a strategic implementation plan that that does show uh, you know where we need to go, what we need to do, the tools that need to be put in place, and does confirm that this ambitious visionary program uh, actually can achieve uh, the targets that were set forth more than 15 years ago at this point um, with the right portfolio of tools. Um, the other elements, uh, uh, you know, just feasibility, right? Taking it down to more of a, you can have a strategic plan, but how do you take it more to the tactical level? Um, you know, for those planners on the call here, I mean, I think you'll all understand in order for an asset uh, to not just get, get built, but to last, um, you have to make sure that you can provide maintenance access, uh, that you're not going to see development impacts associated with it. Uh, you know, you're thinking about litter and its effect on these kind of surface-based practices, and that it's highly well coordinated, obviously, with city agencies like community groups, uh, you know, special service districts, business improvement districts, uh, and power, empowerment zone, you know, representatives. So I'm going to just toggle through some of these fairly quickly. Um, just a, a listing of, you know, some of the public spaces that we've been in, uh, some photos uh, showing some of our installations, but really just kind of listing the partners that are involved and the goals. Um, so obviously working in streets has been a major uh, uh, element of what we've done. Um, you know, the goal is to really align with other capital planning initiatives like repaving uh, and, and uh, um, ADA ramp replacement in the city um, and really starting to incorporate green infrastructure in, into almost all of our, our uh, transportation investments in the city. Um, and just showing some photos, whether they're sidewalk planters, uh, subsurface infiltration basins on, uh, on major kind of major corridors in our city. Uh, and some of them are just all subsurface uh, with no real uh, presence. The one in the lower right hand corner um, really is all subsurface infiltration. Still still does the job of managing stormwater, but doesn't have that green presence we want, but still considered a, a, a green acre. So it takes on different shapes and feels. Um, working with state agencies too. So not just city streets, but thinking about state corridors. Um, I was surprised when, you know, in the early years, uh, how many actual city roads that I thought were city were actually, you know, state involved. Um, so it's not just these major highways, it's actually a lot of uh, connector streets throughout our city that are uh, state owned. Um, so similar mission of how we want to manage stormwater, uh, working with our state agencies and the partners involved. Um, Parks and Rec has been a, a, a instrumental partner as well. Um, the idea is to kind of, you know, manage stormwater every time that, that city Parks and Rec make investments as well. Uh, really try to work with nonprofit partners, particularly to kind of come up with the funding stream for the, the elements that we cannot pay for. Um, and that's stuff like play equipment, benches, lighting, uh, and, and you know, ultimately long-term uh, maintenance of the site. Um, so just a couple of different shots. You can see rain gardens of all different shapes and sizes, uh, all in these kind of little pocket parks and recreation centers we have throughout Philadelphia. Um, Parkside Edge, uh, one of our more signature showpieces in, in West Fairmount Park. It really is an absolutely beautiful installation. Um, for anyone that gets to Philly, I would suggest checking out that entire historical area. Um, looking at facilities and vacant lands, again, not to spend too much time to get through some other stuff, but same same premise here. What partners did we work with? What are our goals? Um, how do we think about vacant lands? Uh, never thinking about vacant lands from building on it and precluding sustainable development or redevelopment in the future, actually trying to take vacant lands that have been orphaned and nobody wants and don't lend themselves to development in the future, and how do we turn them into uh, green installations, you know, within our neighborhoods. So that's kind of the focus of our vacant lands approach. Um, and then just some more photos of uh, some of our practices. The upper right hand corner is actually the Philadelphia Zoo. Uh, again, one of our nicer uh, green infrastructure practices. Um, schools is probably my favorite. I have a bias towards investing in schools. Um, we not just uh, offer an education opportunity for, for kids. Uh, we educate teachers uh, that turns into curriculum. The parents of those students get to appreciate it. The neighbors who live around the, those, those community spaces really understand it. Investing in schools, I think, is investing in large, large neighborhoods. So big fan of our schools program. It's been very challenging, lots of words here, but I just wanted to provide some, some you know, statistics about you know, grant projects and uh, you know, what our goals and intentions are, but also thrown in the, uh, you know, the glam shots on the bottom here as well of talking about how uh, we're bringing in these surface-based practices into our schools. Um, one of the best is the Chester Arthur uh, School. You can really see how 
uh, you know, a, a lot of, of investment was brought in, not just from water department funds, not just from the school district, but, uh, you know, third party sources as well to really transform um, what was always highly impervious, uh, just parking lot areas into real outdoor, you know, living, learning landscape uh, type environments. Um, the Trust for Public Lands has been a huge partner in it. Again, no, not enough time to go through this, but um, definitely a shout out to TPL and all the work that they've done. Um, they've done significant delivery of, of green schoolyard improvements uh, by actually tapping into our incentivized retrofits program. So utilizing our grant program, leveraging funds that they do through grant, uh, you know, grant fundraising uh, and really transforming the schools uh, with the school district. Um, partnerships with other city initiatives, uh, you know, like most cities, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, rebuilding community infrastructure, working on heat stress, uh, I know a lot of cities are probably working on, on uh, uh, vision zero or traffic fatality and pedestrian fatality related uh, safety improvements. Um, so really, how do we align with other city initiatives and try to take advantage of every opportunity of investment to try to squeeze out um, stormwater management uh, from said investments? Um, moving into kind of the design piece, uh, you know, one of the partnerships I like to highlight is the professional uh, uh, community. Um, we don't do a lot of stuff in-house. Uh, we rely a lot on our uh, uh, designers, landscape architects, uh, uh, you know, survey firms, geotech firms. All these folks have an integral piece in how we deliver infrastructure for the long term. Wanted to focus on the standardization piece of it. Uh, you know, solid partnership is predicated on understanding what we need uh, and what needs to be delivered. Um, so just kind of a link into, uh, you know, where we provide a lot of these resources from planning, design, construction, landscaping, uh, you name it, how we want to document, you know, project management, um, CAD standards, uh, landscape design, survey details, geotech, you know, uh, guidelines, just a lot of standards uh, really help our professional des the design community uh, deliver what we need. Um, wanted to point out too the importance of designing with maintenance in mind. Uh, I know maintenance comes up in everything, so I just want to show how important it is to us, uh, but constantly thinking about design with maintenance in mind knowing that these are assets that need to, to, to last a while or else we lose uh, the ability to think about kind of non-traditional infrastructure lasting, you know, maybe as much as, as traditional infrastructure can. Um, the construction partnership, um, not just internal with our own construction inspectors at the water department, uh, but with the con con construction contractor community. Um, one of the things we learned early on was, you know, an appropriate handoff uh, from public works contractors into the into the public's hands. We do a lot of the maintenance. We do majority of the maintenance ourselves. Um, so how we did kind of that handoff about provisional maintenance and thinking about warranties and how we do acceptance was a major, major learning uh, you know, uh, curve between us and the construction community. Um, one of the other creative things too was trying to figure out how do we use construction contractors that are very good at the structural subsurface elements and maybe not so good at the landscaping surface side and how do we actually parse that out? Um, and that was one lesson learned too, was actually, uh, you know, separating the landscaping piece from the uh, uh, um, uh, public works, you know, some of the more structural, you know, subsurface work as well. Um, the other development and other construction community, not ones that are building the jobs for us, but those that are actually building in our, in our cities, in our neighborhood, um, they have impacts, right? This looks like just a, a foundational, uh, you know, dig, uh, for a, a couple of row homes that are going to be coming up. But what you see on closer, you know, look here is that was an infiltration basin, almost disemboweled, if you, you want to use that phrase. Um, but there are impacts uh, due to construction. So how do we ameliorate those? This this is a, a porous street. Um, you know, turned out that they leveled a bunch of houses and wanted to rebuild uh, an entire block. Um, the sediment, the truck traffic, uh, the damage done to the porous street uh, was was uh, er, er, uh, um, we were not able to to, to reestablish uh, um, the infiltration that we needed, so we actually lost this site. Um, but what did that teach us? Um, that we have to educate uh, the construction community, whether it's plumbing ditches, whether it's through one call. Uh, we really need to show that this these assets are out there and treat them like we would any other pipe in order to protect these assets moving forward. And it's not just the development community; these are other city agencies, our electric company, our gas company, the streets department plumbers that do work on our behalf for, for residential properties, um, all were having impacts uh, in our street as well. So that partnership or that education, um, the materials we need to share with, with that construction community is vital as well. Um, focusing on maintenance, 
uh, you know, just the growth of our maintenance program has been staggering. You know, we started out with a handful of sites in, in 2010 and 11 when the program took off. Uh, we're up to around 700 projects now in our inventory. And I think we add probably around 200 practices a year, uh, maybe even more than that moving forward. So we're talking about massive growth. Um, how do we make sure we treat these assets for, for the long term? Well, it starts with really understanding assets um, in, in intricate detail. So one of the lessons learned was document every bit that's out there. Um, you know, where are the cleanouts and and where is the you know subsurface drains and uh, you know what are the inlets that are feeding it and how do you document it for the sole purpose of feeding it right into our asset and work order management system that we do for every other bit of infrastructure. So really just professionalizing uh, you know how we are using GIS uh, to help us maintain GSI uh, through our work order management system. Um, and again, just thinking about standards as well. So uh, maintenance manual and guidance document, thinking about protocols and frequencies, how we do surface maintenance, how we do subsurface maintenance. You know, all these things are, are really what we've learned over years of, of implementation and long-term maintenance. Um, so just two examples, one of the tree trench, one of the rain garden of, you know, what our expectations are for how we want to do self-surface and subsurface. Um, the vegetated piece as well, again, a key element, uh, community beautification, but also is uh, 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 the you know the storm one of these stormwater managers in in these practices. So how do we really look at the landscape uh, and, and the vegetation and say you know what's lasting, what do does better in bump outs, and you know what's surviving, and which ones are having a positive effect and a negative effect, and and really then having that reinforce uh, how we want to do landscape design moving forward. Um, the benefits of wet and dry weather inspections, I think, for anyone that's in this space, uh, you know, we all think it looks great during dry, but go take a look at it in the wet. Uh, sure as heck is going to teach you maybe something you weren't aware of. Um, I always talk about uh, maintenance costs. Um, we get asked all the time, what's the cost of your maintenance? Uh, maintenance costs are a worry. Um, we are much higher than we anticipated when we started the program. Um, but I always get asked, you know, is it sustainable? Can you pin it down to a certain number? Um, and I use that line at the bottom that GSI is really not universal, um, meaning is it in private, is it in public, is it managing off street or is it on site? Uh, is it routine maintenance or emergency maintenance? Is it proactive, preventive uh, maintenance or reactive maintenance? Are you looking at just the surface or so really, you know, GSI is not universal, therefore cost and performance are really context dependent. Um, but I will tell you the cost of our maintenance is much higher, probably double or triple than what we originally anticipated. Uh, and we're working on ways to try to bring those costs down. How are we bringing those costs down? Well, these dots, I don't anticipate anyone, expect anyone to read these, but each of those little colors represent modifications we've had to contracting, to documentation in our manuals, uh, personnel changes, or just programmatic changes um, throughout you know, the first maybe eight or nine years of the program. So I think we're making changes to bring the cost of maintenance down, um, but we still have a long ways to go. The workforce is a key element, right? From the partnership theme again, uh, we don't just do this with civil servants. We rely on professional service communities. We look at arborists and horticulturists and, you know, landscape, uh, you know, firms, um, uh, utility uh, uh, investigation services, um, special service districts, uh, you know, traditional engineering firms that are just doing, you know, maintenance protocol development for us. So, uh, and and one of the ones I really want to highlight is PowerCore uh, PHL, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but it's not just kind of professionalizing the workforce. We actually do adoption sites and volunteer labor uh, as well with community adoption through small grant allocation throughout. So really getting our neighborhood neighbors involved in it as well, taking some ownership at a very kind of light maintenance level. Um, working with special service districts as well. Uh, they're already organized, they're already set up uh, to take care of stuff in their neighborhoods. Um, how do we actually figure out a way to creatively contract with them so they, they do some surface maintenance uh, on, on some of our practices as well. Um, but the one I really wanted to highlight, uh, you know, for those that may, may, may be familiar about this wonderful program, but uh, PowerCore PHL is a uh, at-risk youth program taking uh, uh, adults, uh, young adults between 18 and 25 and gets them some on-the-job training, uh, gets them some uh, 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 professional coaching and uh, uh, schooling as well, um, and really tries to, to you know, help them grow as young adults and turn them into, uh, you know, professionals, uh, give them the opportunity to learn uh, and, and, and a chance to, to get into the professional environment. Um, I have to say that that the entirety of our uh, Green Stormwater Operations Grounds Maintenance Crew all came from our PowerCore program. So every individual you see in that photo came through PowerCore as a as a as uh, an intern um, and now has uh, uh, 
a, a permanent civil service job here with uh, the Philadelphia Water Department. Um, moving into monitoring, uh, continuing down the life cycle, you know, we monitor not just to say, does it work, right? I, I will let you know in a minute, it does work, but um, we monitor to look to make sure we're meeting the requirements we set forth. Uh, is Are we implementing the way we wanted to? Uh, is it efficient? Uh, what materials, you know, did we test out to see how they worked? Uh, how can it inform maintenance? So just thinking about feedback loops um, and how do we take what we learn from monitoring um, and field-based observation and how do we really inform how we do planning, design, construction, how we do retrofits if they need be, uh, and how does it inform maintenance? Um, and I like showing this slide, just how it all connects. Again, just a, an example of, of, of operations and maintenance and monitoring uh, allow us to take that information gathered and really figure out, again, how we deal with uh, public engagement, design, enforcement, working with partners, long-term compliance, and just examples of all the different nuances of, of how it then influences workflow development. Um, monitoring for the monitoring nerds out there, um, continuous water level monitoring, simulated runoff test, capture efficiency. We do a lot of monitoring for a lot of different reasons. This is just trying to capture some of that, uh, looking at infiltration and, and overflow rate, recession and drain down times, capture efficiency. Um, but really what it comes down to is the stuff's been working. Um, we see less overflows than we originally thought. We're seeing higher infiltration rates and faster drain down times. We're seeing excess storage capacity. Uh, and one of the things we identified real early on is your stormwater management practice site won't work if the water is bypassing the inlet that feeds the practice. So early identification of bypass is absolutely critical, and that's what we were learning and monitoring. Um, that leads to our partnerships with the academic community. Uh, that's Dr. Wadzik. Uh, for those uh, may know her, she's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I'm a Villanova grad, so I'm a little partial to the Villanova folks. But um, you know, working on inlet uh, capture efficiency. Uh, and trying to retrofit some sites to make sure that we are really taking the street runoff we need into the practices that need to do the work. Um, working with Drexel University, my, my, my grad school as well, shout out to them, uh, looking at low, low cost sensor technology. Um, we really have eyes on almost every single site thanks to low cost sensor technology and, and the ability to look at uh, you know, gathering uh, intel at, at all these distributed sites and then using the power of R, coding to take massive amounts of data and try to figure out what are we learning from it? You know, how is it that the water receding? Is anything being bypassed? Are we seeing clogs? So really having monitoring kind of inform maintenance. Um, I like this story too here, uh, working with a, a local sustainable uh, business um, to actually fabricate uh, uh, an inlet uh, filter that we now use. So uh, that local economy piece that I mentioned earlier on, how do we you know, engage, you know, our, 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 our local business network and actually have them design stuff that we know we need uh, and have them be part of this, this cycle of, uh, you know, of jobs and investment and, and green infrastructure movement. Um, and then, you know, again, getting involved with some of the uh, uh, real time, uh, you know, storm sensing and, and, and Opti technologies as well. So huge lead in to kind of get to this, this money slide here to show about our progress to date. Um, we have uh, 2,000 green acres in our combined sewage section of the city, about. Uh, this was through June 30th. I can tell you we're up to around 2,050 at this point, uh, on our way to 2,148, which is our year 10 compliance deadline. You can see that 75% of our infrastructure has been delivered through our private program at this point. Um, 685 acres through our regulations, 795 acres through our incentivized retrofits, um, that's 75% of our total to date has been delivered through private investment with about 25% delivered through public. So can't stress enough the importance and power of private uh, in delivering our, our on our long-term compliance needs. The other thing I wanted to show here too is that, um, you know, folks talk about uh, distribution of nature-based infrastructure. And I'd like to show that this these dots here really represent that we are in every single neighborhood in our city. That dark yellow or brownish color is the combined sewer section of the city. Um, but because our regulations and our incentivized retrofits apply citywide, we're actually seeing green infrastructure practices throughout. We also have 500 acres and that number is really low. I just couldn't get it updated in time for this PowerPoint. Um, we're seeing a lot of investment and in green infrastructure in our separate sewer sections of the city as well. Um, but I really love this graphic to kind of show the distributed nature uh, of green infrastructure uh, throughout our city. So this was our curve. This is where we are. Um, we were at year 10, heading to year 10 in June, 2021. Uh, we had to hit 2,148 acres. Uh, and that thing called uh, 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 COVID-19 kind of hit. 
Um, and we're really still feeling a little bit of the effects of it. But what we did is we we negotiated an extension on our year 10 performance requirements. So December 31st is our new year 10. Uh, so we've been implementing for 10 years, but we have not yet our 10 year target yet because the 10 year target is really 10.5 years at this point. So um, we are on our way. Uh, as I said, where I think we're about 100 acres almost to the to the number uh, short, but we have about 600 acres in active construction through all of our pipelines. Um, so we're pretty confident we're going to meet our December 31st deadline. Um, but what I also wanted to point out here too is how much steeper that curve gets. Uh, so we've learned a lot, we've invested a lot, we've spent a lot, um, we've seen the success uh, of a lot of these investments, but we have 15 years to go and the curve ramps up for what we need to implement. Um, you think about that from an integrated planning standpoint and what else we need to do. We're seeing additional regulatory requirements, uh, clearly feeling the effects of climate change. Uh, we got crushed with uh, the, the Hurricane Ida uh, remnants here in Philadelphia a couple weeks back. Um, we're also dealing with emerging contaminants like PFAS, microplastics, um, and we're also a very, very old city with thousands of miles of water and sewer line that needs to be replaced and needs to be replaced soon. Um, so how do we really think about not just our CSO program, which was always based on thinking about integrated planning and sustainable infrastructure for long-term investment? Um, how do we really think about what we need to do moving forward? And we're really at a point right now where uh, we're, we're considering how we want to con you know, uh, uh, integrate our, our permit uh, obligations, uh, current and future, um, into integrated planning has been you know, described in in the, the modifications to the Clean Water Act through through these integrated planning amendments. So um, how do we think about adaptation uh, appropriately that allow us to meet you know, long-term objectives and, and, and really bring about the goals we identified when we first built our Green City Clean Waters philosophy? Um, so I'll close out here with, with again, um, delivering more than just assets, being more than just a, a water, wastewater, stormwater utility, uh, really thinking about, you know, uh, acting more as a, a, a water resource management firm. You know, one of the key things we always wanted to do was deliver more, right? People, planet, and what I intentionally call product because we're not in the profit business as the, as the water department, as a government agency. We're in the making sure we deliver a, a appropriate product. Um, so we did a lot of studies to kind of talk about the benefits of sustainable infrastructure from, you know, your typical economic, environmental, and social. Um, but what we're seeing over the last handful of years is that you know, our hopes and our wishes and our studies and these numbers are actually coming into to reality here. Uh, when we see public published studies on, you know, reductions in narcotics and decreasing crime and fewer prescriptions for antidepressants and higher life satisfaction uh, for, you know, a lot of these things, you know, a lot of these studies are, are looking at around near, uh, you know, nature-based infrastructure, um, you know, really, really well, well, uh, researched information to kind of show that our, our benefits are coming to life. Um, academics as well, increases in scores, you know, positive relationships uh, with nature exposure and student performance, um, you know, higher standardized testing scores and graduation rates. These are real studies. So for those that think, you know, a lot of the co-benefit stuff was, was, was academic, uh, I think we're actually seeing, uh, you know, some data uh, really showing that it's, that it's becoming a reality. Um, and I end with this slide again, I think just really closing out on this, you know, water resource management entity, this one water concept, and and really just trying to make sure that that we all know, you know, our job as 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 water, you know, water folks, we're not just that red dot, right? Yes, we have to provide water utility services, but we also have an absolutely key role in making sure our urban centers are thriving, thinking about land conversation, uh, conservation, thinking about recreation. Uh, promoting sustainable development, thinking about longer term city and regional planning initiatives, uh, you know, really appreciating what industry and business bring to our city, uh, you know, mitigating flooding. So I like to just end with this kind of one water slide to really, again, reiterate the importance uh, and the role we have, uh, you know, working in the in the water industry to to, to kind of think and, and act uh, as one water. Um, and that is it. Um, Thank you so much. That was 93 slides in 41 minutes. So <laughs> hope I didn't uh, hope I didn't scare you too much. Well, well thank you thank so you much, Mark.